Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. So this paper is concerned with the intersections between medical diagnostic looking and artistic evaluation in the art of William Orpen, foremost Edwardian portrait painter, Irish expatriate, war artist, and founding member of the New English Art Club. Orpen produced numerous pictures of doctors, artists, and connoisseurs looking. They testify to the fact that in medical diagnostics, as in, in the production and evaluation of artworks, specialised visual skills are required. This was nowhere more the case than in his 1901 painting, A Mere Fracture. This picture is of a doctor examining a fractured leg in a domestic interior. Through the close anatomical looking of the doctor, Orpen pictured the primacy of vision in his realist project, which emphasised both close observation of surface detail and knowledge of anatomy. In this way, the painting is emblematic of the artist's complex engagement with the nature of visual examination in both medicine and art, a theme to which he returned repeatedly throughout his career. Doctors appear in notable genre paintings from the Victorian period, in scenes which witness them tending to the dying by either keeping a watchful bedside vigil or gently holding the patient's wrist to measure the pulse. By contrast, Orpen's A Mere Fracture depicts the active medical examination of a patient who is in a state of discomfort but is not dying, the title serving as a diagnosis that reassures the patient and viewer that the injury is not serious. It is but a mere fracture. Orpen painted a mere fracture in his friend Herbert Everett's sitting room at 21 Fitzroy Street in London. Exemplary of his early interior scenes, the picture evidences an acute attention to detail in the rendering of the domestic interior and the decorative items within, including the patterned carpet, cabinets of, cabinet of books and the model ship, revealing the impact of 17th century Dutch painting on Orpen's art of this period. The artist used his circle of friends from the Slade Art School as models, arranging them into a stage drama centred on a medical examination. Therefore, the work is, at once, a genre, port, genre painting and a group portrait. This is further complicated by the fact that the painting was an illustration of an incident in William Makepeace Thackeray's The Newcomes of 1855, in which Mr Binney, having fallen from a horse and wrenched his ankle, is paid a visit by the doctor. At the time of the painting's execution, Orpen was renting a studio in the cellar of 21 Fitzroy Street, Fitzroy Square, and the house was known among the artist's circle as the Newcombs. It is therefore difficult to firmly place or date the scene. Is this the Fitzroy Street home of Thackeray's mid-Victorian novel, or the Fitzroy Street that Orpen frequented at the turn of the century? It is possible that the patient in a mere fracture was intended to look like Orpen himself, the body of the artist constituting the object of medical scrutiny. In 1943, the artist William Crampton Gore published an account of the making of a mere fracture in the Times. According to Gore, the model for the figure, an art student named Carr, was easily confused with the artist. He wrote, quote, The model who posed for the man with the fractured leg was a young Slade student named Carr, an ardent admirer of Orpen, rather like him in size and build, who wore his hair cut in the same fashion and dressed himself very much as Orpen did, it was great joy to him to be mistaken, as he sometimes was, for Orpen himself. This interpretation is further corroborated by the fact that the model for the woman was Emily Scoble, a professional life model at the Slade and Orpen's lover at the time. The doctor was modelled by Gore, who was a student at the Slade and a trained doctor. Gore recalled that, quote, I posed twice for 10 minutes. I happened to be a doctor and Orpen said to me, have a look at that leg as if you were examining it for fracture. No sooner had I started examining it than he cried, stay like that, that's magnificent. 
Hence, the vignette of the doctor examining a broken leg, according to Gore, was an accurate enactment of what a doctor would have done if he were examining leg for fracture. Early 20th century instruction manuals for doctors on the diagnosis and treatment of fractured and broken bones, such as Lewis A. Stimson's Practical Treatise on Fractures and Dislocations of 1913, reveal the primacy of touch in the prescribed method of conducting examinations. Accompanying the instructions, Stimson included several drawings and photographs to demonstrate the mode of manipulating limbs by trained medical men. In many cases, these illustrations feature the intimate touching of patients' bodies by doctors, the patients having been reduced to legs and arms and the doctors to hands. Scholars such as William Bynum have shown that the laying on of hands by doctors only became commonplace during the 19th century when hearing the patient's own description of his or her symptoms was replaced by doctors, quote, looking, feeling, thumping and listening to patients' bodies in order to identify symptoms and thus arrive at a diagnosis. This has been recognised as, as a decisive shift in the power dynamics of doctors and patients from one of balanced input to one in which only doctors held the authority to observe and diagnose. Orpen's A Mere Fracture is a study in different modes of touching, comforting in the touch of the woman and diagnostic in the touch of the doctor. At the point at which the doctor touches the injured leg, a red splotch appears. The red paint pinpoints the place of injury, perhaps depicting the patient's blood, It also conjoins the doctor's diagnostic touch with the touch of the artist's paintbrush on the skin of the canvas. In this way, it might be likened to the red paint deployed by Thomas Aitkins to depict the blood on Dr. Gross's right hand in his famous The Gross Clinic of 1875. Hence, in scrutinising the doctor's touch, we are made aware of the artist's touch. In his article on Orpen, published in The Artist in 1901, Wilfred Maynell wrote of the doctor in a mere fracture. Beauty of another kind, the rare beauty of true action, is in the hands as they bring the sensitive fingertips together in search for the place of of the breakage. The draftsman who could express so much with his exquisite vigilant intelligence in the placing of two hands must have dramatic power. Maynell shifts from noting the beauty in the action of the doctor's hands to praising Orpen's exquisite and vigilant intelligence in the placing of two hands. There is an equation here between the beauty and skill expressed in the doctor's hands that search for the place of breakage and the hands of the artists which portray the doctor's hands with such dramatic power. It is possible then to read into Orpen's depiction of a medical examination a representation of the medical of the manual dexterity required of both doctors and artists. While manuals such as Stimson's acknowledged the limits of vision in diagnosing broken bones, only a few years before the execution of a mere fracture, medical imaging had been tr- transformed by the discovery of X-rays. Rochin is attributed with discovering the X-ray in November 1895 and by February of the following year, it was being widely used in hospitals in Europe and America. For the first time, the inside of the body could be seen without incision, but it was a specific part of the body that could be seen, namely the bones. X-rays represented a new type of vision that could penetrate the skin to see the bones beneath. This begs the question... Does Orpen's painting of a doctor diagnosing a fractured bone hold further significance in terms of the medical innovation represented by the discovery of X-ray? The doctor in a mere fracture brings his bespeckled face close to the injury as if he were looking through skin to the fractured bone beneath. In this way, the doctor deploys his senses of touch and sight in order to arrive at a diagnosis. It is my argument that the penetrative looking undertaken by the doctor stands in for the kind of penetrative anatomical looking Orpen advocated for artists in their rendering of the human form. Orpen believed that the close observation of physiognomical detail informed by knowledge of anatomy was the way to achieve truthfulness in art. Moreover, his realism was characterised by a scientific attention to detail Maynell observed about Orpen's The Mirror that, quote, it might be called minute, 
but the minuteness was not that of the English pre-Raphaelites. It had nothing of their laborious look. It had much more atmosphere and was evidently the result of more science, end quote. Orpen inherited his process of close scientific observation of nature from the 19th century French realists. Artists like Edward Manet, to whom Orpen painted an homage, had striven to observe with objectivity the world around them and record it with the kind of detail that critics of the time felt to be deeply disturbing. In her text, Realism, Linda Nochlin considers the relationship between science and 19th century French realism, stating that these artists, quote, if not strictly scientific in their methods, were nonetheless scientific in their attitudes towards nature and reality. Indeed, Orpen was known for both his dedication to life study and his knowledge of anatomy. He took the lessons he had been taught at the Slade in London under the professorship of, among others, the surgeon-turned-artist Henry Tonks, and introduced the practice of life drawing at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. As a student at the Slade, Orpen produced an award-winning life study of a female nude <coughs> alongside a sketch of the figure as Ecuche. Later, as a teacher at the Dublin Metropolitan, he produced approximately 60 large anatomical drawings as teaching aids to accompany his life classes. He even drew a sketch of himself teaching anatomy in a letter to his wife, Grace. The sketch offers a comparison between the anatomical drawing of an arm and the outstretched arm of the artist. It also shows Orpen drawing the outlines of his figures with a continuous chalk line, a technique associated with his Slade art school training. Knowledge of anatomy allowed artists to visualise the foundational structures of bone and muscle beneath the skin, and this is precisely what Orpen illustrated in his anatomical diagrams. He drew ecoche versions of old master drawings and produced an anatomical study of the nude figure in his painting, A Woman. For some of the diagrams, he adapted illustrations from Gray's Anatomy, an anatomical guide designed for the teaching of anatomy and according to, according to Orpen, quote, the only book worth working from. He displayed his knowledge of the bones in his labelled anatomical drawings of skulls, the bones of the arm and hand and the bones of the hip and thigh. He also illustrated his knowledge of the anatomy of the leg and foot, precisely the part of the body examined by the doctor in a mere fracture, in two drawings featuring multiple sketches of the leg from a variety of angles and perspectives. Motifs of close, concentrated looking reappear in Orpen's oeuvre. In addition to the doctor in a mere fracture, two further examples are provided by the valuers of 1902, seen on the left, and the selecting jury of the New English Art Club of 1909, seen on the right. In both these examples, it is an artwork rather than the body of the artist that is being closely examined. The valuers evaluate a painting, perhaps by Degas, of ballerinas talking to their male admirers in the wings of a theatre. The selecting jury shows the artists associated with the New English Art Club, principally Augustus John, William Rothenstein, Philip Steer and Henry Tonks, considering a canvas seen from behind for inclusion in one of their exhibitions. Orpen appears in the scene as the diminutive purple and blue-faced figure wearing a yellow vest. This work represents a stylistic departure from such paintings as a mere fracture. Rather than the naturalistic rendering of the human form based on a meticulous attention to detail through close observation, the selecting jury is more indebted to the bold abstractions of expressionism and the bright artificial colours of fauvism. Orpen's selecting jury represents a grotesque caricature of pictures of the Royal Academy Selecting Committee. Its painterly rendering and expressionist coloration testifies to the stylistic rupture that the New English Art Club instigated from traditional academic painting. Its visible brush strokes invoke the touch of the artist as a rejection of the smooth artifice which characterised academic canvases. The Royal Academy Selecting Committee comprised the most powerful members of the art world who would evaluate multitudes of entries for exhibition in the Academy's summer exhibitions. 
For example, Charles West Cope's The Council of the Royal Academy, selecting pictures for exhibition 1875 of 1876, shows the assembly of royal academicians positioned on the left side of the canvas, considering submissions, which are held and moved by porters who appear on the far right of the scene. The gentlemanly royal academicians, suited, bearded and top-hatted, survey a framed painting of a Madonna and child, the fleshy tones of her exposed shoulder visible even at a distance. However, the dynamics of looking in the scene of artistic evaluation are not confined to the left half of the canvas. Firstly, the porters scrutinise the academicians' reactions as they select and reject submissions. Secondly, to the right of the composition, a group of porters take the opportunity to enjoy an artwork, holding up the canvas and grinning in a way that suggests its titillating subject matter. While Cope's group portrait is of the art establishment wading through the mass of submissions for the summer exhibition, and Orpens is of the avant-garde circle of the New English Art Club, both pictures foreground the politics of looking, the nature of artistic evaluation, and its liability to slip from examination of art to the ogling of naked bodies. In the selecting jury, Orpen depicted William Rothenstein with thick spectacles, <coughs> bending over and leaning dramatically forward towards the canvas. Other portraits of Rothenstein, including John Singer Sargent's lithograph of 1897, show the bespeckled artist looking at art at close quarters, implying that he had bad eyesight. But by bending over and looking at an artwork close up, Orpen pictured Rothenstein in a pose associated with connoisseurship and which was also evident in the valuers. This was precisely the pose assumed by the Roman connoisseur in Lawrence Alma Tadema's A Picture Gallery of 1874 and the subject of satirical treatment by Daumier in The Connoisseurs, circa 1863. Additionally, William Powell Frith's A Private View at the Royal Academy, 1881 of 1883, is replete with vignettes of correct and incorrect modes of looking, including the figure on the far right, who, in the way of a connoisseur, closely scrutinises a painting with the assistance of a magnifying glass. Furthermore, there is another connoisseurial looker in Orpen's Irv. The medical officer who examines the artist's genitalia in an ink sketch from March 1916, which illustrated a letter sent to Mrs. Evelyn St. George, the artist's mistress, from the Western Front. An odd picture to send to one's mistress. In the drawing, Orpen is shown from behind, his shirt lifted and his pants dropped for examination by a medical officer at the war office, who looks directly and intently at his genitalia. Like in his depiction of Rothenstein, the medical officer gazes through dark-rimmed spectacles. A visual connection is therefore established between the close scrutiny of artworks undertaken by connoisseurs and the close examination of bodies performed by doctors. As a result, Orpen's depiction of Rothenstein begs the questions. What in the painting requires such close inspection? Is Rothenstein looking at art or is he looking at bodies? And in considering the implications of Orpen's depiction of the doctor examining his genitalia in the way of a connoisseur, one may ask, is the doctor examining his genitalia or evaluating them? In his portrayal of the valuers Rothenstein and the medical officer, Orpen offered examples of specialised lookers. Furthermore, by showing them looking in similar ways, that is, coming up close to the object, body or body part under examination, Orpen equated the diagnostic looking of the doctor with the artistic evaluative looking of the connoisseur or artist. The archetypal doctor connoisseur was, of course, Giovanni Morelli, who applied his medical education to the development of a method of minute examination of artworks, quote, like an anatomist or pathologist. But the closeness with which the value has come to the partially clad ballerinas Rothenstein to the picture and the semi-exposed handler who supports it, and the doctor to Orpen's genitalia, suggests a scopophilia that belies this kind of close looking. This was reinforced in a sketch which Orpen made of himself, peering through binoculars, the artist's mouth open and panting tongue indicating the voyeuristic nature of his looking. 
Moreover, there is a further reason why the doctor might have been judging Orpen's genitalia in the way of a connoisseur. Not merely a routine military inspection, it is possible that Orpen is having his genitalia examined because he had contracted syphilis. Robert Upstone notes in his introduction to an onlooker in France, the artist's memoirs of his experiences uh, in World War I, that Orpen described his terrible suffering from blood poisoning. Blood poisoning was the name given to serious infection or sepsis. But in a letter to his friend Lee, dated the 1st of December 1919, Orpen wrote, quote, I can't explain what I had, but poison and things got in my middle part and gave me as much pain as I ever want. He added that the Royal Army Medical Corps doctor, Captain Kenny, quote, advises me to have a course of 606 and finish it. What do you think? Upstone elaborates that Salverson 606 was a compound of arsenic that killed the microbe that caused syphilis. It is possible, then, that the military doctor represented in Orpen's drawing is looking at his primary lesion. While the diagnosis of syphilis by this date was microscopical or biochemical, George Stopford Taylor, Taylor and Robert William McKenna in the Salverson Treatment of Syphilis in Private Practice with some account of the Modern Methods of Diagnosis of 1914, advocated, quote, close clinical inspection and due appraisal, appraisal of every lesion within the reach of touch or sight. They wrote that, quote, the microscope and the test tube should, in a straightforward case, always be subservient to the naked eye observation of the expert clinician. While refraining from physical contact with the lesion to avoid contagion, the doctor in Orpen's sketch nonetheless looks closely at the artist's diseased genitalia in a way that suggests both expert attention and perverse enjoyment. Exposed for medical examination in his sketch of 1916, in his illustrated letter to Lee in 1919, Orpen censored his diseased genitalia. As Orpen became sicker, he produced multiple studies of his own syphilitic body, documenting the progress of the disease. But rather than deploying the X-ray vision of the doctor in a mere fracture, these pictures focus on the outward indications of his illness, the lesions and rashes that marred the surface of his skin. In the winter of 19, he drew himself as wailing in pain, the opening in his pyjamas revealing four bandaged lesions and a bandaged foot and neck. Again in 1917, Orpen illustrated a letter to Mrs. St. George with a sketch of himself, this time in hospital, with a rash on his torso, arm, and neck. Hence, he's, he, sorry, here he is hunched over, holding up his oversized pyjama trousers in a gesture that demonstrates how emaciated he has become. Orpen examined his own body more than any other. But through the inclusion of eye patches, censored signs, distorted reflections, and other optical obstructions, Orpen's self-portraits expose the limitations of, vis of vision when applied to his own body. After all, his was the only body that he was incapable of examining with the kind of objective scrutiny that was so integral to his method of portrait painting. He obscured the field of vision in his self-portrait of 1912, in which the mirror is plastered with pages of his diary, old tickets, and engaged notices, so that parts of the artist's body are blocked out. Additionally, in his later mise on a beam self-portrait, circa 1924, an optical illusion is produced by a reflection of the artist seen multiplied from different sides, each having been slightly altered to produce a pattern of overlapping and diminishing faces and palettes which leaves the viewer unable to ascertain the accurate reflection and left wondering if there is such a thing. Finally, Orpen produced a reverse reflection self-portrait of himself wearing an eye patch, accompanied by the inscription, this is my right eye as I see it in a mirror. Here Orpen commented on the relationship between eyes and mirrors, but his right eye, which he sees in the mirror, is injured and concealed. Michael Fried has shown that the mirror reversed self-portrait, meaning painting what one sees in the mirror as opposed to reversing it on the canvas, only became current in French painting and drawing around 1860 among the artists of Manet's generation as an expression of the realist fidelity to visual experience. Additionally, in his account of Adolf Menzel's partial self-portrait of 1876, 
Freed notes that, quote, if a mirror is employed at close range to reflect a person's features, the difference between the respective images seen by the two eyes is too great for them to be effectively combined in a single realistic representation. He continues, the most effective step would have been to rule one of his eyes out of the game, for example, by covering it. Significantly, Orpin compared the kind of vision represented by the French Impressionists and the English Pre-Raphaelites in the Outline of Art, an art historical survey which he edited. He wrote, Impressionism then, in the first place, is the result of simultaneous vision that sees a scene as a whole, as opposed to consecutive vision that sees nature piece by piece. Orpin associated his realism with the French example. Indeed, in his sketch... My right eye as I see it in the mirror, Orpen ruled out one of his eyes by having it covered with an eye patch, thereby ensuring one focus throughout. But it is the eye with which he sees and which he sees that is covered. In turn, rather than a testimony to the primacy of vision, the sketch places at the centre of his ocular realism, to use Fried's expression, an illustration of blindness. As a prolific producer of self-portraits, Orpen was accustomed to self-scrutiny in mirrors. In this pencil and wash drawing of 1910, the picture itself is the mirror reflection in which we see Orpen drawing a circle on a canvas. Hence what we see is the artist making the drawing which we are looking at. Orpen often, in, often inserted himself into his scenes by picturing his reflection in convex mirrors. This was the case in the Mirror, a Bloomsbury family, and the Swinton family. Traditionally, this has been interpreted as a testimony to authorship in the way of Van Eyck's The Arnolfini Portrait and Diego Velasquez's Las Meninas. Orpen expressed his admiration for Velasquez's vision when he wrote that, It is by the ultimate perfection of his rendering of the normal vision of man that Velasquez holds his supreme place among the very great masters of art. Nobody, nobody before or since has expressed vision so splendidly. In turn, it is my contention that in Orpen's art, mirrors function as symbolic representations of the artist's eye. The convex mirrors in Orpen's interior paintings resemble eyes, both in their visual capacity, that is making everything appear smaller by covering a wider field of vision than a normal plane mirror, and in their eyeball-like shape. The Edwardian writer Beverly Nichols made the connection between Orpen's artistic vision and the convex mirrors in his paintings when he stated that, quote, it seems to me that his mind was in some way similar to that convex mirror which hangs on his wall facing that great, mirror, that great window. It is a mirror in which one sees life a little more vividly than through one's own eyes, a mirror that gives a certain unity to even the most ragged composition. But a convex mirror distorts the scene and the bodies within it, as was so effectively pictured by Parmigianino in self-portrait in a convex mirror, and then by George Lambert in the convex mirror, circa 1916. Moreover, working against Nichols's assertion that the mirror gives a certain unity to even the most ragged composition, in many cases, Orpen's convex mirror eyes register vision faltering, the reflection becoming hazy, abstracted, or dark. For example, in a mere fracture, all that is visible in the reflection uh, in the convex mirror is a series of abstract shapes, the mirror having abstracted the scene by capturing only vague impressions. This blurring of the scene in the mirror eye contrasts the motif of the doctor's close scrutiny of the artist's patient's leg. After all, the artist was capable of examining his own leg in a way that he couldn't his own eye. Even in the mirror, we see a reflection of the artist at his, e at his easel, but we also see a woman, chandelier, elaborate frame, and another circular mirror, which together offer a wholly different interior to the one in which Scoble appears with its stark geometric frames and flat color blocks. Another convex mirror appears in Orpen's painting, Night Number 2, and here it has been truncated down the middle by the right edge of the canvas. Its surface is black, resembling an iris enlarged because of the lack of light. 
Next to the mirror is a window through which we can see the night sky. At the top of the window is a blind that is partially pulled down with a dangling lever. Like an eyelid, the blind will be lowered as sleep descends. The scene shows Orpen leaning over the back of his wife, Grace's chair, as she extends her head backwards, the newlyweds connecting in a passionate attitude. They touch the back of each other's necks, the picture depicting the intimate tactility permitted under the cover of night. Hence, like a mere fracture, the painting constitutes a study in the relationship between sight and touch in the domestic interior. At first glance, in night number two, Orpen and Grace appear to be kissing. On closer inspection, however, it is not their lips that meet, but their eyes. Are their eyes closed so as to enhance their sensual pleasure, or are they wide open? Is the convex mirror with its large black iris a representation of what Orpen saw when he looked into Grace's eyes? In their biography of Orpen, P.G. Connody and Sidney Da quoted the artist bemoaning the lack of proper looking on the part of contemporary English portrait painters. And the example he used to illustrate this point was their lack of knowledge of the construction of the human eye. Is there a single one among them, among the younger men, who in his paintings shows that he knows the form and construction of the human eye? The eyeball is a globe from which the iris projects like a boss. Do you ever find an indication of that projection in any of their, pit of their portraits? I do my honest best to see all there is to be seen and to paint all that I see. If the eyes in my picture look real, it is because I know the construction of the human eye and paint it truthfully. But despite the artist's own assertion of his mastery of the anatomy of the eye, the mirror, a mere fracture, and night number two all contain examples of figures with their eyes obscured from view as representations of reduced visibility, making it difficult for the viewer to see the figures fully. In the case of the mirror and a mere fracture, rims of hats cast shadows that conceal eyes, especially those of Scoble, who wears the same hat in both works. As an artist anatomist, Orpen assumed a kind of X-ray vision, seeing through skin to visualise the anatomical depth beneath. As a portrait painter, Orpen sought to express both the outward appearance and inward character of his sitters through the deployment of his penetrative vision. Connody and Dark quote an article from Time and Tide in which Orpen is described as having, quote, a gift for sensing men's weak spots, he sees through to their marrows with one glance of his smallish, sharp, penetrating eyes, end quote. But in the case of Orpen's group portraits of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, the sitters are compositionally dwarfed by their ornamental surroundings, statesmen of the highest order having been reduced to mere ornaments of a bygone age. These group portraits offer Orpen's most elaborate and elaborated depictions of distorted mirror reflections. Stylistically, the Versailles paintings contrast the expressionism of his group portrait of the New English Art Club in the selecting jury, signalling a return to his earlier naturalism. But while they are in keeping with the literal tendency in Orpen's art, they do not establish the primacy of vision. Rather, they pick up a persistent blind spot in his realist works, such as I have identified in A Mere Fracture and Night where vision falters and proves insufficient in terms of conveying accurate information about the object which is being examined, be it the patient, artist, or his lover. Orpen's work as a World War I artist is regularly upheld as his principal contribution to the history of British art. But as an Irish expatriate living and working in London in the early decades of the 20th century, and as a dedicated member of the avant-garde circle associated with the New English Art Club, Orpen's art in many ways worked to undermine the institutional power represented by his elite sitters, nowhere more so than in his 1919 group portraits. The signing of peace in the Hall of Mirrors shows a long horizontal table lined with dignitaries from the Allied forces. In the foreground of the picture, Johannes Bell signs the treaty and thereby admits German defeat. He's pictured from behind <coughs> and is thus lit rendered literally faceless in contrast to the clearly designated individuals from the victorious side. The setting of the Hall of Mirrors offered Orpen with an ideal environment for the study of ornamentation and mirror reflections. The majority of the composition comprises large mirrors, 
which, presu- which produced distorted reflections of the opposite window. The panels of the mirrors are at different angles, and at the points where the panels meet, the reflections become distorted and disconnected. Three silhouettes of the artists are reflected in the mirror. On the first level, this multiplicity of reflections leaves the viewer unable to pin down the artist, reducing him to a shadowy witness to the events being depicted. On the second level, it is unclear whether the the hunched-over silhouette on the left is, in fact, the artist. It could also be a reflection of Hermann Müller, the German delegate who attends to Johannes Bell, or a reverse reflection of Morris Hankey, a member of the British delegation who leans forward to watch the signing. In this way, the silhouette conflates Orban, Müller and Bell, artists and statesmen, Irishman, Brit and German, thereby problematising our ability to distinguish between individuals and to read Orban's group portrait with any accuracy. Finally, the gesture of this silhouetted figure bending over and leaning forward is familiar as the gesture associated with, the con- with connoisseurship in Orpen's depiction of Rothenstein in the selecting jury and the medical officer in his drawings of the medical examination. According to this reading, in the signing of Peace, one silhouetted reflection of the artist examines another silhouetted reflection of the artist to produce a representation of looking where there is no detail or depth to be seen. In Orpen's second canvas, a peace conference at the Quai d'Orsay, the statesmen appear before the fireplace and large marble sculpture of victory in the Salon de Horloge. The highly ornamented setting reflects the showy yet substanceless nature of the delegates and their treaty. Again, the delegates line the bottom edge of the canvas dwarfed by their surroundings. Like in his earlier interior paintings, a round convex surface appears at the centre of the composition. No longer a mirror, it is now a convex clock clock face. It resembles an eye with its bulging surface, indicated by two white smudges, the large dark circle in the centre, its iris. But as a clock rather than a mirror, it does not reflect. Moreover, it is misty and thereby hard to read. The fact that the viewer cannot read time read the time, challenges the reliability of a painting which is intended to commemorate a specific event which took place at a precise time. Additionally, if, as with his convex mirrors, this convex clock stands in for the eye of the artist, then, in the case of his Versailles group portrait, it represents the opaque eye which witnesses but does not see. In its grey surface and gold frame, it is merely part of the decorative scheme, another empty surface." The rendering of this clock in a peace conference references another opaque clock face, that is the empire clock on the mantle in a mere fracture. The empire clock appears directly below the convex mirror, repeating its circularity, resting resting on a square pedestal and flanked by two sculpted figures, which are miniaturized versions of the woman and man standing on either side of the mantle. In both paintings, one of an intimate domestic interior the other, the elaborate interior of the Salon de Horloge, the illegible clocks undermine the legitimacy of these scenes as specific records of actual events. As previously discussed, despite the meticulous attention to detail, especially decorative detail in a mere fracture, the timing of the action is perplex- perplexingly ambiguous. Returning to the convex mirror in a mere fracture, like the clock in a peace conference, it is, on, it is ornately decorated with a gold frame, candel, um, candelabras on either side, leaves and a bird perched on top, and a fan-shaped ornament below. Hence, this is an early example in Orpen's art of a mirror as decoration. In the Versailles group portraits, this decorative impulse reached its full expression. Orpen sent two pen, ink and wash drawings of a peace conference on British delegation Paris headed paper to Robin Humphrey Legg, a music critic and friend of Orpen's from before the war. The inscription on the the second drawing reads, quote, it's all right, Robin, they're a bit mixed up, but it will all come right in the end. Don't worry in Chelsea, I've got my eye on them. What is implied in the painting is made explicit and grotesque in the drawings, further revealing the artist's overwhelming disillusionment with the peace treaty. 
In the second drawing, Orpen replaced the sculpted figure of Victory with a mass of intertwined female nudes. Was Orpen referring to the delegates or these nudes when he wrote that they're a bit mixed up? <clears throat> these figures parody Victory and reference the floating fleshy woman of Baroque ornamentation. But like his naturalistic nudes, they are far from the idealised figure of Victory. Legs and breasts intertwined to produce a vision of a mess of female bodies idealised ornament having been returned to real imperfect flesh. For the last canvas, Orpen painted a tribute to the unknown British soldier in France, a coffin draped with a Union Jack, the red of the flag forming a red line running down the centre of the coffin and streams of red, blue and white appearing like blood and tears cascading down its sides. On either side of the coffin are cold marble busts and a decorative scheme of ornate gilded armaments and weaponry. The glory of war is depicted as lifeless ornament. Charles Fox, curator and secretary of the Imperial War Museum, wrote to the Treasury solicitor that Orpen, quote, originally painted a number of portrait figures in the Hall of Mirrors Versailles, but being dissatisfied with the results, he obliterated all the figures and painted the coffin covered with the Union Jack. Orpen painted out 50 portraits of ambassadors, generals, and admirables. Ad- admirals. Admirals, sorry. Um, in other words, he produced a group portrait with no portraits, reducing not only the peace negotiations, but also the genre of group portraiture to a lone coffin. The large arch mirrors of the signing of peace are replaced into the unknown British soldier with a single dark void representing the empty passage of death with only Christ at its end. The mirror, as symbolic of Orpen's realist vision, is, in this final group portrait, literally blacked out. So in conclusion, Orpen advocated that artists engage in the kind of anatomical looking associated with medical diagnostics to penetrate the skin of their subjects and see the anatomical and psychological depth beneath. His realism, inspired by Van Eyck, Velasquez and Manet, was premised on close objective observation. As a portrait painter, his sitters were the principal subjects of his penetrative gaze. But on closer examination, his art betrays a persistent doubt as to the capacity of his eyes to see all there is to be seen, revealing the limitations rather than the primacy of vision. For the execution of his Versailles group portraits, Orpen returned to the realism of his earlier interior paintings. But by this time, Orpen had gone to war, contracted syphilis, and was less trusting of appearances. In these works, Orpen revisited motifs associated with optics, such as mirror reflections and convex surfaces, but here they constitute a series of visual illusions which challenge the viewer's ability to read the scenes and the sitters within them with any accuracy. Looking back to Orpen's earlier interior paintings from the vantage point of his post-war production, one can identify a persistent doubt at the heart of his realism as to the reliability of vision. Even in A Mere Fracture, a painting about the utilisation of the senses of sight and touch in medical diagnostics, the mirror eye abstracts rather than clarifies the scene, offering a warning that you cannot always believe your eyes. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.